Well, by now, you're probably aware that market inflows are spiking to levels not seen in quite a few months. Yes, the mutual funds have been forced to purchase, but does that mean that you should be buying as well when they do something like this? Well, today we have a look at it and we break down some interesting notes coming in from Goldman Sachs and of course, JP Morgan. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the channel where we discuss stocks, commodities, and cryptos. Today, we're going to talk about the squeeze sentiment indicators that JP Morgan uses all the time. January squeezes, GME squeezes, and of course, COVID squeezes. Where are we right now? The answer is the 99th percentile. Yes, that means that we need to be ultra cautious as we see markets exit the Bollinger Band for the first time in some time. Let's take a look at everything to do with markets right now together. Well, welcome back, everyone, to The Daily Show, where we talk about markets around the world. If it's your first time here, welcome to the community. We talk about macro leading indicators and, of course, the hottest charts. We've even got some crypto discussion that needs to go on today because Bitcoin broke out in a pretty big way. And when it returns back down, is this now a buy? Today, we'll talk about ratios as well with Bitcoin and other markets because it we remember back in December of 2020, things just started to heat up. Has that changed over the last 24 hours? What else was going on the last market day? Well, of course, Tesla and NVIDIA need to be discussed. Energy got hit pretty hard based on the lackluster stimulus from China. And we need to talk about, of course, equity inflows. So first up, we need to discuss the idea that markets have seen mutual funds pull the trigger. This is something that we've been waiting for in markets for a while. It's something we haven't seen. We've talked about neutral positioning. That changed as of last week. But as they pull the trigger and get forced into the markets, we've got a squeeze event on our hands. And this is something that you don't generally want to necessarily get involved with if you're on the bull side. Sometimes patience can pay. And in this case, I think mean reversion is more than likely going to happen. Just a reminder, we share a lot of these charts over on our FX Evolution Twitter. So links in the description down below if you're interested in checking that out. And I wanna show you here the actual mutual fund injection that we've been seeing. This chart here has shown us neutrality between 400 and 600,000, we usually consider neutrality. That has changed over the last week, a massive uptick. Now, when we go in and we have a look over the S&P 500 during general periods of this, you usually don't see these massive upticks happening during a rallying market. In fact, they usually happen during a buy the dip style scenario with smart money. This is where things have changed. And it reminds me a lot of back before 2020s actually fall off, where we saw a big spike coming off no fall off. Then all of a sudden things went bad. Now, remember we had that Dow Jones transportation index five days down with the Dow itself only a few weeks ago. When we got a read like that, generally what did we get? A squeeze of markets. In fact, the S&P last time it happened squeezed up 9% with a very similar mutual fund read. Coincidence? Possibly, but certainly something that we'll be looking at in today's video. We also know that we're in the weakest week of basically this period over summer in the US. It's June 19th to June 27th, and the stats are not positive. In fact, if you actually considered that one negative as well, you'd have a 319 read. Now, things change next week, but if the markets are going to go bearish after the OPEX, after the options expiration, this is generally the time that it happens. The volatility of the volatility has increased. You can see here, we're seeing VVIX up while the VIX itself is struggling until full options expiration on that one. The VVIX or the volatility of the volatility has been spiking over the last 24 hours. Here are similar times, and this was taken over a week and a half ago, that we've seen tech call volumes increase. In fact, most of the times that these things have happened, only one to two weeks away, we saw a relatively decent sell-off. Back to mean reversion, those types of things. The Fed dot plot did absolutely nothing to the market. If you've been watching markets recently, you would know that the Fed has been on one hand saying, oh, look, we're very hawkish. Everything's you know, going to go higher interest rates. And the market's been saying, no, you're not. You're not going to do it. The Fed dot plot recently told us higher for longer than cuts in 2024. The market said, we don't believe you. We don't think you're going to do two rate hikes. Now, imagine if the Fed does come out and do a rate hike. That is now not priced into the market. Something to keep in the back of your mind if we do end up seeing the Fed stick up to their words. What do you think in the comments down below, though? Let me know if you think the Fed will actually get one of these hikes off or not. For investors, which we also like to talk about, of course, there's traders, 
day traders, swing traders, and investors. For a swing trader or an investor, what are you doing in the markets right now? A lot of the time, you're picking out single stocks and sector rotations. And I think that's probably still the best pick like we've discussed over the last couple of weeks. Why is that? Well, the Ford PEs are pretty nasty. They're probably trading about 18.6 right now. And while that's not the most expensive on record, if you're an investor, you really do want to be buying at least the 25-year average. And if you don't believe that that comes back for you, it always does. This chart should show you that you always get at least a 25-year average, if not cheaper opportunities, at least generally once a year, especially for those investors. So is that once a year coming back for us soon? Well, that is really the question. As we saw, this is a week, per, like week in general, after we've had a positive quarter. But typical summertime trading lulls are very consistent. July is usually a positive for tech stocks, but then August, September, a horror period, especially in pre-election years. We can also see here New York Stock Exchange volume one-year seasonal patterns tend to be, again, a bit lackluster in terms of what's going on. If we want to stack some even bigger stats on how bad this week tends to be, you can see here week after triple witching, we get down 27 of the last 33 with the average loss of around 0.8%. And during some periods of time, during 2008, obviously some extremely bad reads during this week. Have we seen the start of that? Well, we got a slight weakness through the Monday. On top of through the Tuesday, I mean, this week. Let's go over here to sentiment surveys. Now, sentiment surveys, as we know, have been one of the better reads of the last year to show us that markets have been topping. 45.2% of people are coming in bullish. I've picked a couple of other survey reports and I can tell you that pretty much everyone out there is on the bullish train over the bearish train. And I shared that in our private community. According to a June 13th bullish advisor report, 53.4% of people were bullish and bearish advisors had slipped back to 20.6% and correction advisors are at 26%. So interestingly enough, what we're seeing here is no one is bearish anymore. Now, does that mean we're in extreme greed? According to the extreme greed indicator, that would be a yes. So again, it's an interesting point. Let's move over now to the options and what's been going on in the zero DT world and of course the wonderful world of squeezes. Tesla continues to absolutely dominate and we've warned against trying to short this stock quite a few times now. It looks like it's going for the magical 300 read. And some people rightfully pointed out in our usual Monday stream, which of course we did on Tuesday this week due to Independence Day and happy Father's Day as well for everyone out there that celebrated that. For Australians, we haven't had it yet. Um, but so thank you very much for your comments. But uh, yeah, it doesn't happen till September here. But basically, we did see a huge rise in general transactions going on with Tesla again. And we've seen a lot of pretty big pickups in a couple of the stocks. One of the ones we've been really focusing in on recently finally had its day in the sun. In fact, the first hour of trade, we saw huge options positions to the call side come in, which we'll look at soon. PayPal on a run, 3.7, really nice. Another one we've been looking at recently was Disney. It faded again, back down to pretty much where we started in this particular run on Disney. Very disappointing. Pre-election years do tend to be pretty bad for it. I would say if it doesn't turn the next 24 to 48 hours, it's pretty much done for in that one. And that's the power of, you know, different positions. Another one we've looked at recently, Intel was down 3.8, but still up massively from the 20s that we saw only a few weeks ago. One I found interesting was Zoom. Zoom was trading at a 1.6 to 90 day average volume with a bunch of calls coming onto it. Is that the next pick for people? Look, Zoom is really beaten down stock similar to an Adobe, similar to a PayPal. Even if the markets go bad soon, sometimes some of these beaten down stocks can hold it up. Let's move over to the zero DTE of index options trading. And of course, as you see here, we got for, for again, another period. This is two times in a row now. The two biggest options positions of the day were puts. Interesting. The market was down on the session, but puts are starting to make up more and more and more of the top 10 on the indices. Is this showing us that there's some exhaustion finally starting to appear in the markets? Well, if we go through some of the stats, this is the one that I think is most interesting here. SPY puts at a 415. Look at this, August here. So we've basically got a finally a decent volume position coming through on the puts at 415. That's a lot lower than the current price. Is that a big player starting to bet on exhaustion in this market? The first time we've seen that 
pretty much ever <laughs> over the last couple of weeks. Let's move over to the other options positions. It was really just people buying tons and tons of calls all over Tesla. You can see they're still striking up. Some Tesla call over here going for the 300 strike. And then there was PayPal. PayPal getting two massive call positions coming through here. Look at those weeklies there. Very, very nice. And that helped to really, I guess, extend PayPal's gains over the last 24 hours. We've been spotting that one for a little while. A few people are on SPCE as well. I noticed in the chats, I wouldn't recommend that one. I think SPCE is a trash stock, but you know it moves the way it does. For a long time, I've had a bit of a fight with it. But look at PayPal showing up here so many times. It was just an incredible amount of options. Let's move over to rotation. So what happened over the last 24 hours? Well, this is the last five days. Consumer discretionary continues to do relatively well. Now, that's interesting because you would think the American consumer is quite weak right now. Well, the market's pulling that index up. And this is the thing. It usually goes semiconductors, technology, and then, as we mentioned, consumer discretionary. Consumer discretionary being one of the better sectors recently, and metals has been improving as well based on China stimulus questions. And of course, they've been a little bit lackluster over the last 24 hours. We were looking for staples, healthcare and utilities doing well in today's session. It just didn't happen. Look at this. It was terrible. Uh, basically, utilities was down two, not very good. Staples was down 1.46 and healthcare did okay. So of the three main defensive sectors, we only saw one realistically holding better than the market. Gold was down hard. We'll talk about that later on today's video. But yeah, there wasn't much selling going on in the right sectors and not enough buying going on in the defensive sectors. So that kind of breaks our trend for now. So just before we jump into the charts and we take a look at all of the key levels that we need to be watching right now, I want to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, which is Tiger Brokers. Now for the New Zealand members out there, listen up because there is a special offer that they will not repeat again. They've entered the market in a big way and not only are they offering US $50 worth of my favorite share in the market, Microsoft, when you fund with New Zealand $2,000 over the first seven days, but you also get a little bit of a stock voucher and more importantly, zero transaction fees on the first four times for US and AU shares every month for life. That's pretty damn good. And of course, for other members in the community, there are a bunch of other special offers for FX Evolution members in the description down below. Now let's check out here why we like the platform. Well, of course, there's a great mobile app and most platforms are starting to do some pretty damn good mobile apps. But the poor desktop crowd, like you and me probably, we've been forgotten a lot of the time. Well, not at Tiger Brokers. They're constantly improving the platform. Here you can see I've got the Apple chain up for options, IV, PC ratios, looking at the options, and obviously on the right-hand side, you can get level one and level two data. But on top of that, you've got one-click trade and the analysis platforms, PE, PE ratios in general for Fords, target ratios for the economists out there on average. These are some of the things that used to be only in the Reuters platform or Bloomberg. Now you can get them within Tiger Brokers. So what are you waiting for? Check them out in the links in the description down below and see if it's right for you. All right, well, let's jump into the charts now and we'll start off here with Bitcoin versus NASDAQ. One of the members of the community want us to look at this and boy, oh boy, were they correct over the last 24 hours. We spat on that resistance. We never saw the turn. We'll talk about it soon. And it looks like for now, the bulls have control of Bitcoin. So for people that, actually I'll put on here the watermark so you guys can see which combo I'm using here. But for people that are buyers of Bitcoin, as an investor, as a concept, if you believe in the new bull trend, this is an interesting ratio to watch. Now, of course, you may remember if we go back to the previous time we went into a bear market, when was that? 2020. It took a while for Bitcoin to get sorted, but then all of a sudden Bitcoin exploded out and it is always the first crypto to go. Now that the FUD or the SEC information is starting to kind of dwindle, I guess, on the charts, is this ratio becoming important again? Well, I would argue it's probably important for an investor, but for a trader or a day trader or a swing trader or anything like that, it's probably not going to be that important. And the reason why is because for an investor, comparable to the NASDAQ, Bitcoin is relatively cheap. In fact, it's basically the same uh, ratio trade price as around October lows of last year. Now, you may be aware that Bitcoin is considered, of course, a growth style asset. So therefore, if it's trading around October lows, which we can see over in here as a ratio to the NASDAQ, then that should mean 
that maybe it's due for a little bit of rebalancing. Well, of course, that's what technically happened over the last 24 hours. Bitcoin moved up very strongly. As it took out this high here, it was always going to move into this red box. And this red box is a mixture of supply that's on the left-hand side. So incredible spike through. You can see here the downward trend line. My thought process over the last 24 hours was, of course, the same thing I always had been saying, which was we finally got our potential short zone underneath here. If we had shorted off down to there, I believe the markets would have continued to short and maybe go down to our 24.2. Was 24.8 the low? I don't know yet, but certainly Bitcoin's big rally through here was massive. The daily closed fairly strong, which is important. It's rallied since that point. For bears, you're really having to hope that this level here holds towards the short end. But Bitcoin as a ratio is relatively cheap. And if you believe that the markets are going to continue up on the bull side, is Bitcoin becoming one of the most interesting buys moving forward? Could it move to 40,000 or even higher? It is distinctly possible. And certainly the price action over the last 24 hours breaks many bears trends. And uh, I didn't think it was going to happen. But when it did, when it takes that high, you're going to lose any of your shorts. That's just the reality of the situation. And you've got to reassess. And at this point, that's a strong close. We'll be looking for the weekly as well this week. That will tell us a lot about Bitcoin's next move. But if we take off these highs, especially 30,000, like 300 ish, and close a weekly above that, I'm telling you, Bitcoin could be on for a big run. And that's to the bull side. So we'll watch that very, very soon. Let's move over to one of our combos. Now, we've changed the combo here a little bit to include the Magnificent Seven, as everyone's calling them. And why I'm bringing this up is just to show us mean reversion. The market has not mean reverted, which has come back to the 20 moving average in quite some time. Now, the Magnificent Seven is 21.1% away from the mean, that is the 20 moving average. I can't think really of a time where it's been too much further away from that other than 2020 recovery. And of course, what did we get similar reads around these August highs? If you remember, we saw all of the same types of things. Tons of calls. By the way, today's call rate was 57% calls to the puts. We saw tons of calls for a couple of weeks. We had high sentiment. And at the same time, we also saw... JP Morgan's squeeze indicator. So it's just time to be cautious in markets. Single stocks, certain things, as we've mentioned throughout this rally, that's really probably the better play. As an investor, would you get rid of your position? I think most funds would descale certain stocks at the, around these times. As we mentioned, the volatility of the volatility is spiking up. That shows you internal vol is actually starting to spike again. We last saw internal vol spiking into February, which you can see here. February 15th, internal vol kind of started to spike up, similar period over here. It could be a coincidence, but certainly something we're watching. The SKU market continues to get crushed. Let's get rid of here the S&P 500. We've already detailed that SKU works quite well in this way and is just one of the reasons that you'll be looking at being cautious. Look at the crush here. The black swan indicator is getting smoked, and that's exactly what you want to see if you are feeling cautious in this market. Does it mean you have to short it? No. Have we seen a swing trade towards the short? No, only day trades. We'll talk about them also soon in this video. Let's move over to PCC, put call ratio. Well, again, got crushed back down here as we see calls reignite the markets. Interesting, we'll talk about that soon. Move over to copper. It's trading around these highs. It traded up due to stimulus expectations. China stimulus looking a little bit shaky in terms of what the market wants to see. My thought on China would be that I believe stimulus will come back in and it'll come in hard and they'll just continue to pump it over the next coming years. And of course, I think it's a strong thing for metals when we see the right signs. Copper in supply at this stage though, so don't be surprised if demand destruction does take over, but we'll watch it very, very closely. Let's move over to central bank liquidity. They keep lying to us guys, and it's the same thing as always. We're almost back up here in basically a combo code of the Fed, which is the green line here replacing the liquidity in the markets as high as they did during, of course, the crisis of the banks. Yeah, they claim they're tapering, but let's face it, with all of the combos put together, what you end up getting here with this indicator is, is effectively showing you that they might be saying, oh, we're raising rates and doing stuff, but they're still finding some support. Now, what does that do? Well, it means that at the moment, is this market too high? In my opinion, yes, it is. Doesn't mean it can't go higher, which we'll look at soon but it's probably too high and it deserves a mean reversion. 
The problem for bears is going to be that unless this thing turns down and actually starts getting destroyed, we're not seeing central bankers actually pulling back the way they should be. And that is a major concern because as we know, this market over the last couple of years has been driven by this central banker injection. Are we too far away? Personally, I believe yes. Uh, so we're looking for turns. We're obviously looking for the same thing, playing single stocks on the bull side, playing sectors on the bull side, and then waiting for the next one. I think that calls also are one of the better plays still at the moment just to protect yourself from potentially getting smoked in what could be, according to Goldman Sachs, a 5 plus percent move in only a couple of days. And the probability of that, according to the VVIX and their reports, is showing that it's increasing each and every day this market goes up. So yeah, just some interesting things coming out from the internals here of some of the big bankers. Let's move over to the dollar. It was up. It came off that most bull zone trade area that we were talking about. We saw some buys. We end up finding a long leg doji. Is this extended to the downside? I would say yes. And I would think that the dollar may stabilize around this point. If you're a bear on US dollar, which I don't blame you for, uh, this area will be interesting. But I think this gap as well uh, may need to be filled. So we're watching here very much the US dollar. At the moment, it's showing us bullish signs. And a few of you guys were bullish over the last 24 hours. What about gold? Bad daily close for this one. I mentioned in the live stream on Tuesday open that if gold closed at these lows, it would probably mean that we're moving towards the 1900 level. We almost got to the side where we thought the bulls were back in town, but it didn't break through our heavily traded zone to the upside. That stops us from being able to be bullish. Let's face it, it's all about these nuances in trading to be able to figure out whether we've actually seen activations or not. For now, the trend is still intact to the downside. We've not really seen mutual funds or bigger asset managers buy gold in recent weeks, as we've detailed here on Twitter and the channel. So probably back down to the demand zone over on the left-hand side, 1910, 1900. At this stage are the current targets towards the short. Let's move over to oil. I still think this is neutral. It's based on China stimulus. It's floating around a zone that makes it very difficult to be bullish or bearish. So I think we'll probably just stick with the idea that it is neutralized. Uh, if you were going for day trades, you would say this is the short area though for oil uh, with stops above that high. How good is it? Probably about a 50% trade, but would pay around two to one if it worked. Let's move to single stocks. First up, PayPal, great day for it, fantastic move. You can see here 3.7, really didn't have any bearishness, huge options, real potential for a gap fill. And if you actually run uh, some of the things through these highs, such as this trend line, you'll notice it lines incredibly well with the gap fill levels, which are here. So there's still a bit of room in PayPal. At the moment, it is a risky trade, of course. It is priced in by options, squeezing this thing up. But you can see the volume, such a beautiful amount of volume down here, really showing you the big players are back in town on these stocks. SoFi continues to be weak. Uh, we kind of called the top for that the other day, which was 982. So far, it's dropped off. I still think that SoFi is looking pretty bad. I'm looking for it back down into the kind of 7s and 680 levels. Intel had a bad session for it as it took and tapped this high. I'd like to see Intel find buyers again. Still looking for 3840 here in that gap fill for Intel. We'll see if it can get it done. Target, the factor of many people hating this stock makes you kind of want to almost buy it. Uh, it has had the V-shaped return. So somewhere in these lower points here, somewhere around that kind of 130, I'm interested in seeing whether Target can find buyers. And it's pretty extended towards the downside. It doesn't mean it's absolutely turned, but the weekly was positive. I've still got two levels down here that I think Target could reach, but this would be my first bullish zone on Target in, yeah, a very, very long time since really over here in 148. Let's move over to Tesla. It cannot be stopped. And I don't suggest we even try to stop it at this point. The gap fill happened on the real market. It kind of sold like day traders might have tried to have a go at it. And you can see it sold twice off that gap fill. Then it busted it and it was on. 5.34%. More good news coming out for Tesla, sharing their network with every single person under the sun for the time being anyway. That's, I guess, good. And people are now seeing this is the cheaper AI play versus NVIDIA. So that's what people are also buying it for. 300 seems like the next move for Tesla at this stage. Very little to stop it as it kind of rallies up. We'll find out whether it still can. Semis, they're in the hot seat. I think that semis are at what I would call a descale position. Basically, this is a very good level for markets to start to weaken. And if you actually chuck a Bollinger Band on semis, I encourage you to go do that and do a little bit of study on 
what happens when it when it moves this way, especially on the weekly. Let's move over to the US 2000. Interesting, we tapped into our demand again, saw buyers. This must be taken out for swing traders to feel good about shorts. Weakness certainly is in the NASDAQ, in the Russell 2000. But as we know, this is our demand, not these lows. So yes, you might think, oh, new low, Tom. Look at that, it's shorting. Not until you take that one out, guys. So at the moment, it did have a little bit of a positive spike off that level. Day traders would have been excited about buying in there. Decent trade, certainly like catching the falling knife, but certainly a good level. No turn switch though to the bull side yet. You're going to probably need to take out around 1880 for that to happen. Let's move over to NASDAQ. What's it doing? Well, NASDAQ's really far away from the mean reversion, that's for sure. But I really just bring the NASDAQ up to show you how it spiked into these wick highs. And that is really, along with the Russell and the Dow Jones, the main shorting style reasons that we have in this market. Very far away from mean reversion, good critical resistances, all of the good stuff that you usually want to see. Same thing here, just taken with the NAS 100 futures. You can see the way it's traded. Let's go down the 15-minute chart, just have a look at it. And what you'll notice, I haven't got anything else on this chart here, is that we haven't quite seen a turn event, but you're going to have to watch this one for bulls. I think it's going to be very important to put a line through around 15,140. If you do get that spiked up, it does point the picture of a new high being formed in this market. So we're teetering on two levels, no turn point yet. Now let's talk about S&P. So as JP Morgan show us the squeeze, what is the S&P showing us? Massive closure. That is a huge closure. And I put it in the private macro that I do weekly. I just thought I had to share it with you guys as well here on the community channel. So basically, it's a huge closeout. And I don't need to tell most of you that trade Bollinger's that when you close a weekly outside the Bollinger, you are showing exhaustion. Along with TD13s, along with other things, it points towards, even though s and is not at the critical levels that we would usually expect being maybe a 43.50 previously or a 45.30, which is my next level, it is exhausted. There's usually only one to two weeks left before a turn occurs. And this is in line with everything else that we've been talking about. Again, how big's the turn going to be? I'm looking for mean reversion. It makes some sense on the markets. And again, I would suggest if you're interested in some of my further analysis on this, you can check out our seven-day free trial for the private community. Watch the weekly analysis. I've put in a lot of confluence on what I'm thinking of here. And again, doesn't mean you have to trade towards the short side. That's much harder. But it gives you a bit less FOMO and a bit more opportunity to say, okay, these stocks are better targets. And of course, at the moment, we're looking for the mean reversion. And potentially, these are the times that really changes you from a great investor or trader or anything to being someone that just approaches markets with a certain level of neutrality if possible. Now, let's move over to what the key levels are here for the US 500. And the first one that we see here is a relatively interesting turn and it hasn't turned for swing traders. I've kind of theorized that 4338's the key low to be taking out for the S&P. It was a weak session, but then it found some rallies, which we have to expect. And I kind of expect us to come back and touch this zone, at least. You know, that would give us our average kind of short off for the normal weeks, such as this June swoon. But if we don't take that low, I find it hard to believe that we can possibly trade down to a 4150, 4200 zone. So this is where the swing traders will come in. And I think what will probably happen is something like this, where it will rally up afterwards. Ideally, these zones will be hit. And then we'll find out whether the bulls really do control this market with some nice mean reversion levels. What about for the news for the week ahead? Well, let's scroll down here. As we know, Fed Chair Powell's coming out to annoy us again. That's going to be fun. Then we've got a whole bunch of press conferences from other central banks around the world. Fed Chair Powell annoying us again on Friday. And that's the main news along with Flash PMI. So realistically, there's nothing too crazy coming out here uh, this week in terms of news. I think you need to be paying a lot of attention to the Powell discussion that may be affecting the markets. But I don't think there's anything that we necessarily need to worry about other than watching for the right technicals and keeping an optimistic mind maybe in certain sectors, 
And at the same time, just being, you know, neutral, I think, with this current market FOMO. If you're interested in finding out more about, of course, Tiger Brokers special offers, do remember there's some for the Australian viewers, some for everyone out there. And at the moment, New Zealanders are really reaping the benefits of a new promotional uh, kind of campaign for them. So check them out. Links in the description. Support the channel if you can. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe, smash the like button. We'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.